Suboxone and methadone have proven to be life-saving for people in recovery. But if it's so accessible and successful, why do more and more people continue to die from overdoses? Laura Ullman continues her investigation into drug treatment and recovery and joins us live now in the studio. Laura? Darren, in part one of our special report, we told you how residential treatment programs can be costly but critical for care. Now, in our part two, I ask experts and users how medication for opiate use disorder factors into the recovery process. Music and art is so extremely healing um, because of what it does scientifically for the brain. And also, you know, being in recovery, it's a very spiritual journey. So what it does for the spirit. Melinda White says she was born with an addictive personality. First, it was candy, then catching frogs. If I can catch 20, then 50 frogs are better. If I have one candy bar, 25 kids. So I was always a more, more, more. If I liked it, I wanted more, no matter what it was. From a loving family in St. Albans, she also grew up curious, wanting to understand and experience everything. She was a teen when she tried marijuana, then alcohol. But I always said to myself, I will never be like those junkies out there that use cocaine and shoot up heroin. Like, I'll never be like that. And I was a horrible, judgmental person in that way. Because at the time, I thought, those are the, those are the losers. Um, little did I know that I would become that loser. It was a failed suicide attempt that first moved White toward abstinence. Her youth pastor and spirituality guided her out of despair. She now helps others through medical and clinical recovery. At the end of the day, I know what worked for me. I also know that doesn't mean it's going to work for everybody else. Kelly Peck, a researcher who studies adults with untreated opiate use disorder at the University of Vermont, agrees. You have to take a person-centered approach to treatment in that, like, not, not, every, not everybody is the same or has the same goals. Peck is currently studying medications for opiate use disorder, or MOUD. The medications are part of what some know as the hub and spoke model. Vermont was the first state in the nation to implement the hub and spoke model. The hub refers to the place where people can go for higher level of care at the beginning of their use of MOUD. It's the only place people can access methadone, which activates opioid receptors similarly to narcotics. Spokes are primary care offices or outpatient addiction services in one's community. Places White has worked. A spoke is when a person is allegedly a little bit more stable in their recovery that they can get a prescription for sometimes a week at a time, two weeks at a time, sometimes maybe a month at a time. Medicine for opiate use disorder attempts to stop cravings and or withdrawal symptoms. If your goal is to abstain from non-prescribed opioid use, these medications are going to give you the best shot at doing that. Studies shared by the National Institute on Drug Abuse show that those who use methadone in their recovery are 4.4 times more likely to stay in treatment than those who don't. Another study shows that the treatment failure rate of those given Suboxone was 25% compared to 100% of those who received a placebo. While the data shows the medication works and doctors almost always recommend it, it doesn't always produce its desired results. We introduce you to Josh Lash, who currently lives in a recovery residence. He can't take medication while staying there and has had a tough time coming off of methadone and suboxone I'm still withdrawing from it i'm still you know i'm still getting bad mood swings my body hurts he says it inhibits his ability to feel emotions and to taste food people need it some people i don't think should ever take it despite his challenges medication is typically the top option for people in recovery and with access to this potentially life-saving treatment being easier than ever why are more people than ever dying from overdoses one of the challenges that we face now is um, how do we make treatment even more accessible how do we for the folks who um, how do we get people engaged? Things were looking up toward the end of the last decade. Overdoses were down, more people were in treatment. So what changed? Pre-COVID, there was really a real, a real build and collaboration and talking together. And then as we all sort of had the retreat to our homes for COVID, that disrupted things a bit. And then with the introduction of fentanyl and xylazine, as that got worse, it's sort of like a double edge. On top of COVID and a more toxic drug supply, White says she has also seen a shift in the type of care for people in recovery, a focus on compassion and forgiveness instead of structure and accountability. For myself, I love science in a sense that sometimes I just need to see black and white, tell me what's gonna work, let's do this. Side. The gray area tends to be sometimes where the most healing can happen.
As many of the experts have said, there is no one-size-fits-all for people in recovery. But as the drugs become more dangerous, it's become harder to get a grasp on the problem. In the final part of my special report, we explored the lack of recovery residences and why some say if we only had more beds, it would address a major gap in the recovery process.